For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are the true stories, the plain, unvarnished facts just as they occurred, reenacted for you by a British car. Only the names, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is finished by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. You will now hear from the man in charge of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum, Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Good afternoon. This is not, for a change, a murder weapon. But through its use, a murderer was brought to book. It is normally a most innocuous article, innocent and in its way useful. You do recognize it, do you not? Of course, it's a blotting pad. Regrettably, magenta in color. Big enough to hide a newspaper beneath it, if one wishes to hide a newspaper. You find blotters like this on desks in the writing rooms of small hotels in Britain. And strangely enough, that is where Superintendent Edward Weston found this one. I shall ask Superintendent Weston to tell you about it. Edwin? On the eve of the August bank holiday weekend in 1931, July 31st to be precise, since the holiday itself was to be Monday the 3rd of August, and I was planning to spend it at Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain, I was notified that I was wanted for the investigation of a murder at Oxford. I sighed regretfully over the departed thoughts of Stonehenge and the friar's heel, said yes, sir, quite politely, and was told I would hear shortly from a man in Oxford and put up the telephone. It immediately rang again. Superintendent Weston? It is rather you speaking to you, sir, from Oxford. And I am as doubt that Jesus College and my dear sister Megan have been murdered, Superintendent. They said to me, Superintendent Weston will come. And indeed, I am sick with horror. Uh, what's that? I am Arthur. You will speak to you from Oxford. And... You are the man who was to call me. Yes. Indeed, I was told to call you, sir. It was your sister? Uh, who murdered her? I don't know, sir. I was told you were coming here. You're in Oxford? Uh, tell me where to come in Oxford. It is a cottage called the Boundary, sir. It is in St. Clement Street. Uh, St. Clement Street. Uh, yes, sir. It's merely the London Road where it crosses the Infly Road and the High Street near Magdalen Bridge, sir. I'll find it. Will you be there? I shall be here, Superintendent, with my dear sister. There is also a policeman here. I took the midnight train which deposited me in the university city before daylight. I found the cottage near Magdalen Bridge without much difficulty. Arthur Hughes was there, uncomfortable in a stiff chair beside the door. The constable was frankly asleep. I identified myself to Hughes and we went inside. Uh, she's in here, sir. Where? I have lifted oh. away three of the cushions, sir. On the tabletop. She was completely hidden to them. I came to the house, sir. Wait. I will turn on another light. Yes, that's better, thank you. Is it your usual custom to come here? Uh, we had intended to spend the holiday together, sir. I came to take her to the train. And this is the way you found her? Uh, yes, sir. Under this pile of cushions and this tablecloth, I lifted uh, her You off said and, that. Uh, uh, yes, sir, I did indeed. And this is the way I found her, sir. Moved anything? Uh, no, sir, I am not. Uh, the house is exactly the same as it was. The medical man barely touched her. He did not need to, as you can see from her head. My, my, my poor sister. Yes. I have have you any idea? I have none. What's your business? Profession? I'm a scout at Jesus College. A scout? I think I told you. Uh, that is the accepted term here in the university for personal servant, sir. I am a young man from Canarvon. A fine non-conformist, young gentleman. Welsh? Uh, yes, sir. A great many of the scholars at Jesus College are Welsh, sir. You're Welsh, too. Uh, my sister and I come from Pontypridd in Glamorganshire, sir. Yes. 
You were on good terms with your sister, of course. I was that. I love my sister dearly. And you say you have no suspicions? I have not, sir. If I could think who in the world had done this, my hands would be at his throat this very minute. I should not be here, I assure you. I think the first thing to do is to remove your sister's body to the mortuary, Mr. Hughes. Uh, that is well thought of, Superintendent. If I waken the constable at the door... Uh, please do, sir. Uh, so I will, then. An ambulance was duly fetched. We removed the cushions which had been placed on top of the body which was forthwith taken away, and Hughes and I devoted ourselves to an examination of the room. To me, it is quite evident that my sister was taken by surprise. What makes you think that? First, there on the sideboard is a small nosegay of flowers from a garden. Every morning, my dear sister took a nosegay to the grave of our sister Maud. She has not missed one morning in the eleven years since Maud died. If the flowers are still here, then... Yes. Anything else? Uh, you can see through this door the room in which my dear sister slept. Uh, please notice that her bed is only half made. <coughs> yes, I see. And in the scullery, here are her breakfast dishes, still unwashed. She would never leave them that way. Yes. And here is her new vacuum cleaner. She left that too. Yes, but the vacuum cleaner isn't connected up. Huh? You see, the flex isn't plugged in. She wasn't using it. There is something strange about that. What's that? She always vacuumed the house in the afternoon. Not in the morning. She was a creature on impeccable habits. But my dear sister... I don't think I follow you, Mr. Hughes. It is quite evident she was interrupted this morning by the bed and the breakfast dishes. And the vacuum cleaner should not be here. Sure you didn't put it there yourself? Of course not, sir. Why should I? Sure, I don't know. It was there when I came in. The, do the door was unlatched and there it was. And she was lying here under this great pile of... Ah! What now? That's not my sister's vacuum cleaner. Whose is it, then? Whose is it, can you tell? It looks ever so much like the one she bought last uh, Lady Day. The uh, last of uh, March. But it seems different somehow. Huh. I don't know. I was here with her when the man delivered it to her, but... Uh, know what I think? No, sir. I think you're dotty. Uh, wouldn't she be doing with a vacuum cleaner in the morning? I'll have a look in the dust bag to see if she was using it. Or the house she'd use it without connecting it. The dust bag? That's what's different. Different? Quite right, sir. I've seen this vacuum cleaner a dozen times, and the dust bag dark red. Just like the one I have at Mr. Morgan's room at college. Uh, the dust bag's a peculiarly hideous shade of cerulean, Mr. Hughes. Yeah? Blue. Sky blue. Well, darker than sky blue, but it's blue. How could it turn blue, sir? I don't know. Are you sure you're not mistaken that it hasn't always been blue? I was here, I say, when it was delivered. And it was red. It was red yesterday, sir. Then what's happened to it? Has it been it's changed? It's been changed. Oh, no. Well, why should she change it? My sister? She could not change it herself. She couldn't mend a saucepan. Well, who changed it then? Besides, where would she be getting another dust bag? This blue one. And from the vacuum cleaner shop. There is no vacuum cleaner shop here in Oxford. She bought it from a peddler. Would you recognize this peddler if you saw him? You've seen him before, have you not? He's a nice, such a nice, pleasant young man. So quiet. Eh? Yes, I have seen him, but... Uh... What's his name, do you know? No, I do not. No, Superintendent. I do not think I ever heard him. Do you know where he lives? I'm sorry, I do not know that he does. Well... I'm sorry. Yes? Well, we have no idea that he's even been in Oxford. Since he sold your sister that machine, if that is the machine he sold her. It is the machine. Do you see where the enamel has been knocked off the front of the thing? Mm -hmm. That happened the very day he fetched the machine. He knocked it against the door with it, And he let my sister have it for a shilling less before off because of the damage. Oh, oh yes, I know that machine. It is indeed the same one. Except the dust bag. Yes. Look you, Superintendent. It is daylight outside now. Well? I can go out and wake up some of the neighbors for my sister and ask them if they have seen this peddler here today. Yesterday. Uh, for now, which is tomorrow. Huh. 
Do you know the neighbors? Indeed. And do then. Go and ask. I'll go over to the police station and see what I can learn. Then I'll return if you've learned anything. Uh, shall I come after you, sir, or will you uh, return here? Better come to the station, Mr. Hughes. Uh, yes, sir. And if I'm not there... Uh, yes, sir. I'll be at the mortuary. But you wouldn't want to come there, I suppose. And why not, sir? My, my dear sister is there, is she not? <laughs> They could tell me little at the police station except that a neighbor's child had mentioned having seen a man undescribed at the door of Miss Hughes' cottage, the boundary, sometime during the previous morning. The man appeared, the child said, to be carrying a large parcel done up in green paper. And further, the child said nothing. And the man was seen no more, according to the best reports. Was this the mysterious assailant, thought I, and repaired to the mortuary? It was too early in the morning for the medical examiner to be there, but having attained access to the dreary base, I examined the dead woman's body myself. I told she had been beaten about the head with some sort of blunt instrument. There was a fearful wound in the back of her head, sufficient, in my opinion, to have caused death. In addition, there was an incised wound in her neck, which alone could have caused death. She had apparently been dead for some 24 hours, which would have put the time of the assault, as we had supposed, about Friday morning. She had bled copiously, with dried blood adhering to her head and neck. No other wounds were visible. I returned to the boundary cottage in St. Clement Street and was surprised to hear voices issuing from the cottage. I entered. I looked at you when I came, and about ten pounds, all that Well, good morning. Uh, good morning, Superintendent. Good morning, Mr. Hughes. Good morning, madam. Hello. Uh, this lady is Miss Dora Abernathy, sir. I am one of Miss Hughes's neighbors, sir. I live at the bottom of St. Clement Street. Uh, Mrs. Abernathy has been a close friend of my dear sister for many years, sir. This is Superintendent Weston from Scotland Land, Mrs. A. Are you an inspector, sir? A superintendent, madam. A superintendent, Mrs. A. Oh, uh, I thought everyone from Scotland Yard is an inspector, sir. Forget Not me, all please. of us, madam. Uh, Mrs. A saw the man indeed, uh, Superintendent. You did, huh? He stayed at my house overnight, sir. Did Mr. A object then? Oh, you know Abernathy, Mr. Hughes. He's seen the day when he hadn't the price of a night's lodging either. You're speaking of this vacuum cleaner peddler, I assume. Uh, yes, sir, Inspector. Uh, superintendent. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Superintendent. He was here then. At least in the city, sir. The little girl told the police she saw him here, or saw a man at any rate yesterday morning. Oh! You may interview the child later, Mrs. Uh, Abernathy, and see the child's description tallies with that of the peddler. Who is the child, sir? I believe her name is Daphne Cubbins. Uh, Cubbins? Oh, Cubbins? I, I trust Josie Cubbins is young, and even if they have got one of them pongeranium dogs always nipping the postman. You said this peddler stayed the night at your house, Mrs. Abernathy. Yes, sir, he did. Oh, you know him that well, then? Well, sir, not precisely. He sold Abernathy and me a vacuum cleaner like Miss Hughes's, sir. Oh. Mm -hmm. And he showed up yesterday afternoon. Not yesterday afternoon, Mrs. A. It was the day before, you said to me. Oh, yes, that's right, Mr. Hughes. The day Abernathy was at the doctor's for his blood pressure. Thursday, while Abernathy was at the doctor's for that matter, and he said he was in the city and had I any complaints about my vacuum cleaner. I said no, and I offered him a cup of tea as a matter of course. Oh, um, Superintendent, did you ever drink Lapsang Souchong tea like Mr. Churchill drinks? I didn't know Mr. Churchill drank tea. Abernathy's cousin, who's a sergeant in the Royal Court Catarus, says he does. And when they hadn't any Lapsang Souchong at Aldershot, when Abernathy's cousin was there, Mr. Churchill had to drink brandy. So I bought two ounces by mail to, from Fortnum and Mason to try. It costs the fright, but Abernathy likes it. Well, Mr. Podmore came Who's in Who's Mr. Podmore? The gentleman who sold me the vacuum cleaner. And we drank Lapsam Su Chunk. I'm not chucking my weight about, sir, as the bus used to say. It's really very good, although expensive. Smoky. And then he looked at me, and I could see tears in his great brown eyes. He's a very handsome man, is Mr. Podmore. Yes, that, sir. Quite good looking. It's very likely he murdered your sister. Go on, Mrs. Abernathy. Why was Mr. Podmore weeping? He finally came out with it. He'd lost his money. 
Well, I just couldn't stand it. I went to the tin we got the lap sand soup chung in, and I took out part of the money I didn't there, and then I handed it to him. Here, Mr. Podmore, I said, accept this as a loan until you find your money. How much did you be lending him then? Four bob, I think it was, and sixpence. And when did he pay it back, Mrs. Eyre? He didn't have a chance, Mr. Hughes. When he left in the morning, he forgot it. He'll pay it back. Oh, indeed. Tell me, Mrs. Sir. <clears throat> have another. He took the money. Yes. But there was no bus to tame that late in the afternoon, you see, sir. He was going to tame then? The tame, yes, Mr. Hughes. He said. Tame is only about uh, 12 miles away, sir. Yes, I know. Uh, would he be there now, Mrs. Eyre? Uh, we could go there and fetch him, I would think, sir. We'll wait, Mr. Hughes. Then did you show him to his room? No, sir. He said there was some business still to be done and he went out. And then he came back and he was carrying a parcel. Done up in green paper. Like the ironmonger he uses, sir. How did you know? And what was in this parcel? Oh, I don't know, sir. He kept it in his hand. And when he came back, he went to bed. After we had a nice cold supper, And he kept the parcel with him when he retired? Uh, Yes, sir. And, And then when he went out this morning. And didn't come back? He said he needed a shave. As he did indeed, sir. He was bearded like a prophet, sir. And didn't come back. I think he forgot about my four and six and caught a bus to tame, like he said. There's one about noon, sir. Or maybe he'll send it to me from there. We do he won't. Is there a police station in Tame? In Tame, sir. I think so, sir. Oh, but I'll get my money back. I don't want to have the police talking to Mr. Podmore about that, sir. Nevertheless, the police are going to talk to him, Mrs. Abernathy. But not about that, I can assure you. Before I talked to the police at Tame, I asked some other questions in Oxford of the ironmonger. Yes, I know that bloke that was peddling vacuum cleaners here. Cost me money, too, he did. I sell vacuum cleaners myself. But I've no cheap wire purchase arrangements like he has. I think it was real cheek, him coming into my place yesterday to, to buy a hammer and a chisel for me. Though he did pay me. That was my money. Abernathy will skin me. And the barber, Dusty Miller. Louise, he was pointed out to me more than once, this peddler. What more he calls himself? As he walked into my place of business yesterday morning, carrying a green paper parcel that clanked and a set of ginger whiskers down to his collar button. I shaved him, never asked him to see the colour of his money, and he gave me my sixpence, all right. It's the last copper I've got, he says, with a great orate laugh, and pops off. And didn't I see him two hours later, as drunk as a duke in Charlie Wilson's public house, and offering to buy me beer? Of course he had money, the best part of ten pounds, all tied up with a black and white checkered air ribbon. And when I said, you've got money now, didn't he say, I've been visiting a lady? Uh, my dear sisters, the ten pounds was tied up with a black and white check of air ribbon she wore when she was a small child in Pontypris, in Glamorganshire. Hello. It's Superintendent Weston of Scotland Yard speaking. Please put me through to the police station in Tame. Tame which is a country town of about 3,000 population, is about 12 miles north of the city of Oxford. It is a typical small English country town, too close to the other largest cities to have retained its ancient importance as a market town. I had taken into consideration that visitors are comparatively rare in Tame. After asking the Tame authorities to report to me at Oxford by telephone, I asked to be put through to Aylesbury. Aylesbury. Just across the border between Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire is a town of nearly 30,000. It is a well-known center for straw and laces and is a municipal borough, the capital of the county of Buckinghamshire. Travelers by bus from Oxford to Aylesbury transfer at Tame, a few miles away. As I anticipated, Tame knew nothing about a vacuum cleaner salesman named Podmore and answering to the meager description I was about to give them. Aylesbury was more reassuring, however, than about midnight the 1st, August 1st, the first day of the bank holiday weekend, I received a telephone call from Sergeant Urquhart there. Take it, Sergeant Urquhart. Yes, sir. At Ellsbury. Now, sir, so far as we've been able to discover, your man is not in Ellsbury. Oh, too bad. Well, sir, we're not sure he hasn't been here. What's that? <laughs> Perhaps he 
lamplight and says that we are sure he has been here. Oh, good then, I hope. Yes, if he was here, we're reasonably sure. At least a vacuum cleaner salesman was here, but his name seems to have been Hughes. Hughes? Yes, sir. Arthur Hughes, sir. Arthur Hughes. My name. I think that's our man, Sergeant. Is he still there, then? Sir, I think my Uncle Dan has done a terrible thing. Your Uncle Dan? What's your Uncle Dan got to do with it? Well, sir, he owns the hotel where the man was staying, sir. What did he do? He chucked the beggar out, sir. What? Why? What's the matter, sir? Why? Why? Tell me that, Sergeant. Well, sir, this, this Hughes was here the other day, and he went away yesterday without bothering to pay his bill, you see, came back this afternoon on the bus from the train, and he came back to my Uncle Dan's hotel as big as life and asked for his room back again. Did he get it? Yes, sir. The clerk gave it to him. And then my Uncle Dan found out about it, and he went to this vacuum cleaner fellow's room, and he said, oh, quite properly, I'll have my money now, if you please, mister. And the vacuum cleaner man said, I haven't any money, and he didn't, so my uncle chucked him out, and where he is now, I don't know. Your Uncle Dan? Isn't he at the hotel? The vacuum cleaner man, sir. He's gone? Well. What did you know, sir? He's gone. Oh. You don't know where he is? Well, his suitcase is in the hotel, sir. He brought it in with him when he came back, and Uncle Dan made him leave it there, sir. Tell him to keep it there. Do you hear me, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I hear you. Uh, yes, sir, yes, I'll tell him. What do you want me to do then, sir? Put your uncle in jail. What? Come on with me, Mr. Hughes. Indeed to goodness, sir. Where are we going then, Superintendent? We're going to Ellsbury. I think we found the man that murdered your sister. In the hotel room at Ellsbury, we found the suitcase in the room where the guest had left it when he had been told he was no longer welcome. Arthur Hughes watched me as I opened it, watched me as I lifted it up and turned it over. What is that? This is a hammer. Uh, this is a chisel. That is what he bought at the ironmonger's then. That's where one buys things like this. Why did he carry things like this about with him then? Are these the tools of a vacuum cleaner salesman? If you will pardon me, I should say they are the tools oh, of the murderer. No. Oh, yes. Do you suppose that, that my sister... Tell me. I don't know. Look. What's this? What? These. What are these? Red crumbs on the floor here. Did they, make, did they not fall out of the silkiest too? wonder what they are. Here, look at the hammer. What? The label's been scraped off the handle. How shall we tell that it is the armor we bought? How shall we tell it was his? I think I know why the hammerhead's so clean. Why is it? It had blood on it. Oh, please. My, my, my poor sister. And the chisel? Mm-hmm. It's clean, too. Quite clean. He'd have to have it clean. If indeed he is the man who did it. We can't prove he's the one. No? Not yet. My, 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 my poor sister. If only knew where he is. Yes, if we could find him. I wonder if he gave an address when he came here the first time. I could not tell, I'm afraid. He wrote any letters or anything. Who would that be? I don't know that either, Superintendent. Come in, please. Yes? I'm Sergeant Urquhart, sir, of the Buckinghamshire Constabulary. I don't speak station, sir. I told you... About time you got here. Where's your uncle? You said arrest him, sir. What shall I do? Let him out. Uh, yes, sir. And then? Wait, Sergeant. I want to find this man. Hughes, sir? I'm Hughes, officer. Are you the... Well, isn't he... Oh. I beg your pardon, sir. What I want to know is, did this man who called himself Hughes give any address when he came here? Or did he write any letters? Did he say anything about where he lives? I don't know, sir, but we could ask the attendant in the commercial room next door. So it's, it's, it's where letters are generally written, sir. You come along, then. Come along, Mr. Hughes. Yes, sir. Through that door, sir. This one? Yes, sir. Come along. Joe! Oh, Joe! Joe! He isn't here, sir. He's left for the bank holiday, I fancy, sir. 
I see. Here, these blotters. On the table, sir? On the table. Well, that's where the guests generally blot their letters, sir. Not convenient. Have you got a mirror, Sergeant? Mirror, sir? Mirror. Look in front. A mirror, man. There's one on the wall, sir. There is indeed, sir. Shall I take it down? I'll get it, sir. Oh, don't drop the blaster thing. I'll look out, I tell you. I've got it, sir. Uh, what do you want me to do with it? See these signatures on the blotter? They're reversed, sir. That, that's a characteristic... Look in the mirror. Oh. I can read them now, sir. Can you, then? I can read them, too, sir. Look, here is me. Uh, better not bother with that one. What's this one say? Dear Uncle Jack... Oh, <laughs> I wrote that myself. I can't read that one either, sir. Read all the others and write them down. Perhaps one of them is this. Well, sir... I want them all copied down, and I want every one of them investigated, Sergeant. And if one of them is the man that murdered my sister... Someone murder your sister, mate. If we find him, I will kill him with my own hand. Oh, no, you won't, mate. I swear I will. Don't trouble me. We'll hang him. And when I went back to the other room and sat down, my eye fell on the curious objects that had fallen out of the suitcase I was already beginning to think of as the murderers. The things that looked like, as Hughes had said, breadcrumbs. I picked one up. It wasn't a breadcrumb. It was a tightly rolled wad of paper. Curiously, I dipped it into a glass of water. It opened up like a tiny flower petal, and I saw printing on it. I opened it up. I reached for another and repeated the performance. Another. Same results. I put them all together after a manner of a jigsaw puzzle. The printing was clear now. High-grade steel forging. And there was something else, too. Bloodstains. There, on the missing labels from the hammer and the chisel from the man who came to change the dust back on the vacuum cleaner in the house of the little old lady in St. Clement Street. I hardly noticed when the sergeant and the brother came in with the list of dresses they had copied from the reflection of the names on the blotter. But four weeks later, when all the addresses had been checked by policemen working round the clock, there was one of them where a man named Podmore lived. And he was an itinerant salesman of vacuum cleaners. And when the time came, he confessed. And at the Oxford Assizes next spring, he was sentenced to hang. And hang he did. And Arthur Hughes smiled when he heard about it. On Whitehall 1212 today, Lester Fletcher as Superintendent Weston. Others in the order of their appearance, Harvey Hayes, Willem Williams, Patricia Courtley, Gordon Stern, and Guy Spall. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Blood and blood plasma are of vital importance in treating wounded men. They are the one treatment for which no amount of medical skill can provide a substitute. To give our soldiers in Korea the blood they must have for life, 300,000 pints a month are needed. The American Red Cross will not take your blood unless it is perfectly safe for you to give it. And if you're one of the forgetful people, think it over. You'll realize that giving blood is about the most important thing you have to remember. So before you forget again, phone your local Red Cross blood collection center. Tell them you want to give your blood to save an American life. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Mm.